Hello and welcome. It is time for the Phil Talk Sports Podcast. That's right, it's that time again. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Phil Talk Sports. On today's episode, pro wrestling takes center stage as today begins the Wednesday Night War. As AEW Wrestling, All Elite Wrestling, will have its first television show, AEW Dynamite, on TNT tonight. Uh, it'll go head-to-head with WWE's developmental brand, and I say developmental with the biggest air quotes in the world, as NXT will be over on the USA Network. So tonight, me, Billy, and Jake, the former cast of the Ringside Seat podcast that I used to do before this, we're going to hang out, we're going to watch AEW tonight, whereas uh, one thing that's good about the NXT is it goes on the WWE Network the night after, so it makes it easier uh, to catch up on that later. Whereas I don't have cable, I don't have USA Network, but I do have the TNT app, which is how we're going to be watching AEW tonight. So we're going to give that a watch and kind of break down their show because we know what NXT has to offer. We've all been to NXT events, the three of us. I've been to takeovers, I've been to taping. So while the product is, is amped a little bit more, I know what to expect from them. AEW, I'm curious what their television product is going to look like as opposed to their big pay per views and their live events that we've been to. So tonight we're going to. Watch that show and, you know, give our thoughts on uh, how it looks. And my biggest thing I'm looking for is I don't want it to be better than Monday Night Raw or NXT right off the bat. I want it to be different. I think the key word here is different and unique uh, because that's what you want out of AEW. You don't want another. We've seen so many. Uh, Ring of Honor, who's had its time in the sun. TNA, who I used to be a big proponent of. Uh, they turn into WWE light, and that's when things take a turn for the worst. So what we really want to see here is just... Can they provide a different product or a different looking product than what WWE is already offering us in its several brands that it has nowadays? It's not just Raw or SmackDown. They have 205 Live, which I think is going away soon. They have the NXT. They have NXT UK, so they even have a little bit of uh, that flavor thrown in. So I'm really just curious on how they can make it different um, from the product that we see every week till now. I know they're... um, Pay-per-views have been a little hit and miss. There's been stuff that's been great. There's been stuff that I could live without. I've been to two of their events already so far, one in Daytona Beach, one in Jacksonville. Both were very good in-ring action. They ran a little long for my taste for when they started. They go about four hours, which is one of the things we always harp on WWE about. But I guess, you know, pay-per-views, you know, you can get away with that because the other positive is they don't do a pay-per-view every month. They're going to do them maybe not quarterly, but pretty close. So they're only going to do, you know, four to six a year is what it's looking like, which I think is a good call. It makes every event feel more special. Um, I'm someone who likes to get people together to watch pay-per-views, but uh, when it's once a month, there's just it, life's too too hectic for that really to happen. So uh, there's a few I've missed. You know, I always hit Royal Rumble, always hit WrestleMania. There's a few others if uh, matches intrigue me that I like to get to, um, but that'd be about it there. But overall, I'm really excited to watch AEW tonight. Wrestling's always kind of, not always, but uh, you know, as I get older, it's something that I kind of fade in and out of. I never fully lose interest, but I'm definitely not as into it as you know I was growing up, which is the case for a lot of us. Um, but I always tend to catch fire on the Royal Rumble time. The Royal Rumble is my favorite pay-per-view of the year. I've always had a party for that and everything, so the Royal Rumble always piques my interest. It lasts through WrestleMania season. Sometimes it fizzles out, you know, by SummerSlam, but with AEW, it's definitely, you know, caught our attention. A lot of us, you know, me, Billy, Jake included, um, but tonight there's a lot of good things I'm looking forward to. Looking forward to Hangman Page versus Pac, which was going to be the original championship match for AEW. Obviously, Pac had other plans for that. They're going to highlight a tag team championship tournament, which I think a good tournament is always uh, good to have in wrestling. It's very basic storytelling, but it always gets the job done. Uh, MJF versus Brandon Cutler, which if you watch Being the Elite, has a story that's been building. I'm surprised they were able to hold on to it this long. I figured that's something that would have been on their either All Out or Double or Nothing or one of these shows. Um, So the fact that they've slow burned this, I'm actually looking forward to and that they saved it for this television show. I think they're going to probably have a good video package because it's something that's been building on being the elite for a long time. So that's a good story. I don't know how great the match will be necessarily, but sometimes the story makes up for that. John Moxley, who um, had an elbow injury, uh, was going to make an appearance. What that's going to entail, we don't know yet. And I believe there is Cody versus Sammy Guevara, which I think is going to be the first match period on the show, which I'm a huge Cody fan. Sammy Guevara has uh, impressed me in the times I've seen him. I've seen him live now, I think twice. So overall, 
There's a lot of good matches on this show, and I'm very much looking forward to breaking it down when it's over. So uh, I will see you guys then. All right, the first episode of AEW Dynamite just went off the air maybe five minutes ago. I'm here with Billy and Jake. The Ringside Seat Podcast crew is back together for the first time in a long time, guys. It's good to have you. Thank you. Yeah, had a good night tonight. It was fun watching the debut episode of AEW. And uh, you know the Wednesday Night War kicks off tonight. Is you know if it's if it wasn't called that before, it definitely is now. Um, really quick, what was just your initial reaction of the show starting and everything? Like, what did you get the vibe you expected to get from this show? I got what I expected. Uh, I it was kind of predictable in some of the outcomes, and that's kind of a negative. But it it was a very fun show, and quite frankly, that's all I wanted. Yeah, overall it was a good show. I mean, there was some obvious outcomes, but you know, on the flip side, there were some surprises too, some surprise wins, and you know, some surprise debuts as well. It was uh, overall a good show. I think it's we're almost been spoiled with AEW so far because their shows have been so sporadic that you expect like a pay per view level show almost every time. So like, yeah, you're gonna have predictable matches, but like, you would get that on a Raw or SmackDown. So it's it's going to take a while, I think, to understand like the t- the TV version of it. And sometimes you're you're having a finish just to like move ahead for another one. But um, not that we'll break down every match here. But like that opening match with Cody Rhodes and uh, Sammy Guevara, I thought that was a great way to kick things off. It went, and I called this before it even started. I because with Cody, he just he likes to prove that he can make anybody. So the matches go a little bit longer than maybe they should. I mean, there was a really good false finish that could have easily been a great finish to the match i think they passed up a great finish for a good one if that makes sense uh but overall i think it's a good match is a great way to kick everything off yeah cody uh cody made sammy look like a million bucks uh, similar to what he did with darby allen at uh, at fighter fest and i'm glad they didn't go for a draw because like you were talking about during the match if it keeps going on like that it'll get overused yeah, I thought it was a really good match. You know, they established Sammy Guevara as a definite heel. Um, I like the spot where uh, he incorporated Brandy into it, kind of referring to what you were saying, Phil, about with the the different finishes in the match. Oddly enough, there wasn't even a crossroads in the match. It was No, we had a disaster kick, yeah. but yeah, no crossroads. Yeah, and just went with a roll-up, which was kind of surprising. Which I, I think I mentioned this in like while we were watching it. The main thing I want to see from AEW is I want more matches than not to end not with their quote-unquote finishing move. I think that adds a level of realism. I feel like TNA was really good at this for for a spell back in the day. Um, I don't think really, I don't know if MJF's finisher is a submission. I don't know if that was officially it. But none of these ended with just your run-of-the-mill. I guess technically Jericho won with uh, with the spinning back elbow. But like none of it was just uh, you know five moves of doom hit L1 and L2 to store your SmackDown finisher and hit triangle. Like, there was none of those. Yeah, I went way back there. But, uh, you know, I I enjoy the fact that these matches can end in any way. Uh, The women's title match, same thing. Um, I didn't think there was a way to have Rose lose that. I'll probably jump around here a little bit, but to lose that women's title match, I made the joke during the match. I I think she'd have to shoot her to win, and it makes sense. And I guess they pulled it off. I, that was a relatively believable way to end that. What do you think? They they tried their hardest to make all of the match outcomes as believable as possible, which I did appreciate. And uh, and they made uh, they made the logical choices with all of the matches, and that's really all I wanted, and that's what I got. Yeah, for this match specifically, it was a, a surprising outcome for me because I was expecting Nyla Rose to pick up the win. Uh, having Riho win was actually a, a welcoming surprise. I, I wanted her to win, um, but uh, with the match itself, with Nyla kind of being this monstrous figure going up against a you know under a hundred pound featherweight uh, in Riho, I feel like you know the the odds were stacked against her. I, I really like the spot with the chairs where she did the senton onto him. I thought that was a, a good spot. Uh, overall, like Jake was saying, I do feel like there was some believability to the match, and I thought it was a, a good match overall. I mean, we we joked about it, but with with the belt, the size that it is, good, good looking belt by the way, very old school, very classic look. But uh, I, I don't think that would have looked right on on Rose had she won. So I don't I don't think that was really a tell necessarily because we've seen 
people too big for the belts they win in the past. Big Show comes to mind, obviously. But um, no, that was a it was a genuine surprise, and they did what I didn't think was going to be possible, and they made it believable in the way that they did it. The match reminded me a lot of the Bailey Nia Jax match from Takeover London, and uh, and I was thinking the whole time like, how is Bailey gonna do the belly to belly on Nia? But they did it in a very realistic manner. And so I think they did it in a realistic manner with uh, with Rio and Nyla Rose. Yeah, I think they did. They actually did something similar here, where she did her Northern Lights, but from the from the corner, which made it possible to do. She obviously wasn't going to do it flat footed, so I think that actually you know made sense. In the words of the wise philosopher Sheldon Cooper, "Ah, gravity, thou art a heartless bitch." <laughs> um, I don't. Another thing I really wanted to look for, I, obviously I'm not going to only talk about the positives. There was, from a technical standpoint, from a production standpoint, there was a few snafus, not a lot of them, which, but the fact that there was a few, you know, like, like if, if you have a perfect show the first time around, you're bound to have a bad, really bad hiccup, you know, the next time. I think the only things that came to mind is somehow they found the one patch of seats that didn't have people in them to show on camera. How they pulled that off, I commend you, because that place was packed. That place was rowdy, and they found the one glob of 15 empty seats that were in that place. It was 99% full, and they just had to find the 1% of seats that just were not filled. Like yep, they the found the EC3 section. The supremely cheap seats that no one wanted to buy even at the last minute. Yeah, well, kind of to your point, Phil, how you're saying, you know, with the production problems, you know, Granted, they have only had four shows. Right. And, you know, I have been to each of their shows, and this has been the first show that I've seen, you know, from a live standpoint on, you know, their broadcast. And from going live, I, I have noticed that there was production problems in the arena itself. You know, if you, you can't see the action that's going on, they, they weren't showing it up on the Titantron if they were down on the ringside or where, where have you. I did notice tonight that when... Moxley came out and attacked Kenny that the the pitcher was actually up on the Titantron, so the crowd was actually invested into what was going on. Right, so that I definitely helps. they've improved on that part. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's only up from here, and they can find out what works, what doesn't work, and we'll just are along for the ride. In the production crew's defense, uh, I've been a part of many TV crews. I've produced episodes of television. I've been cameramen. I've been literally every job other than coffee boy on, the, on TV crews. And so... In the production team's defense, mistakes happen, and they're going they're going to happen no matter how much you prepare. So, I, I think that they have a very experienced crew, and they're going to get better the more and more they do television. So, I respectfully say that we shouldn't harp on this too much because stuff happens. Yeah, the easiest way to make God laugh is to tell him that you have a plan. No matter how much you plan things out, there is going to be issues like that. And everything I saw was extremely easily correctable. Like there was a video package that kind of sputtered before it started. Like this is very simple, very easy things to make happen, but very easy things to correct also. Like it, making an issue like that is not a problem as long it becomes an issue when you make the same mistake multiple times on a show like that. So um, I saw very little, like obviously two of the three people in this room have worked in television, and I think if you don't have the eye that we have, you probably notice even less of those, and we noticed three, maybe four total. So overall, I'd, I'd give them an A-, a minus for the whole show as far as production goes. Um, so the picture-in-picture picture commercials, this has nothing to do with the crew, this is just the way, I guess, TV is going. Do you guys like the picture in picture? Obviously, cutting away from a match is never ideal, but does this fix it? Does this make it better? It's not ideal, but if they're going to do it, I'm glad that they did it in the fashion that they did it tonight. Uh, I when when I first noticed it, it was during the angle when Jericho was attacking Cody after the Cody Guevara match, and I was like, "Oh God, please cut back to the action," which I guess in a weird sort of way was doing its job and it got me hook line and sinker but at the same time it just it just took you out of it so it it, it's a bit of a mixed answer but in a but in a sort of way i'm not happy that they are doing it but if they are going to do that it's television they gotta sell sell stuff i understand i am glad that they're doing it in the fashion that they're doing so you still say it's better than the traditional we'll be right back commercial break
Yeah, because you can at least see, see what's what happening. is going on. Yeah. If, if you can't hear it, but you can at least see it, and that way you'd be like, come on, let's go, let's cut back, come on, let's go. Like, it, it cuts a little suspense out of it, but at the same time, it's like on the edge of your seat and all that. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things. I feel like, you know, if there's a casual viewer just flipping the channels and they see the, the commercial, but they also see the wrestling going on, that might be something to uh, pull the a viewer in and um also with it you know i don't think it's the best solution to the problem of having to go to commercial breaks uh kind of like what jake was saying you know there i feel like there's a disconnect with you know not having that audio within the the actual show of itself when you're just having listening to the commercial and trying to focus in on the picture you know commentary does help a lot with the enhancement of the match um I think, you know, in a perfect world, how I would like to see it is, you know, you have your match, you know, the match is over, you go to commercial break, you come back, you have a new match, you know, with segments and time restraints, it, it, it really isn't um, feasible for them to do that, so... I guess At least not is, every time. Yeah, the, this is a band-aid, and, you know, they're... they're they weren't doing the pitcher and pitcher every time either. Like it, it, it happened maybe like three or four times throughout the night, and, and, it, and at the points where it, it should and we needed it because you know there was actually stuff that we wanted to see going on. So it, it is a, a solution to a problem. I don't know if it's the right one, but it is working. Uh, yeah, I feel like when there was when they were between matches, they took those opportunities to cut to actual commercial breaks, like. When, like I said, the, the biggest notice, uh, it was the first time it happened, the, the, the time you notice it the most, when Jericho attacks Cody, you you can live with it there because you're still seeing it. Now, if Jericho had got on the mic, which he's known to do after jumping somebody, and starts talking and you're missing that, then you're upset. But when it's like, all right, I get it, he's throwing him around the ramp, he's throwing him around the ring, you know, I can still see that. And, I mean, the first time I've really seen anything like this is, like, Monday Night Football started this. It was usually after a touchdown, after the extra point, before they kick off, you know, the offense and defense got to go get a run off the field. Both special teams units come on the field. You got a good two, three minutes there, and they don't cut away from that. But even though you don't really miss anything because no play has happened, them not turning away from it, you still feel like you're not disengaged. I guess what I would like to see is, like, someone who watches a lot of soccer, there's no timeouts in soccer, and they wouldn't dare um, – cut away from a game because your goal can score at any moment. So what they really do is it just in the middle of the game, almost like your late 90s, you know, tune in to watch the Goldbergs on UPN. Like, they just have full-fledged graphics pop up on the bottom, whether it be for Coca-Cola or for another show on TNT. But, like, if you want us to believe this is a sport that, any, you know, who's to say that the second you cut to that pitcher and pitcher, a guy doesn't roll somebody up and get the win. So maybe the way to go about that is more like, and, and maybe this is the other way I could put it. The picture-in-picture, picture, the commercial is still the bigger square. Maybe if you make the action still the bigger square, and you can still give the commercial the audio, but like it, you're never fully unimmersed from it unless you want to be, unless the commercial does catch your eye and you want to listen to it. I, I could maybe see that being uh, the easiest uh, fix. Still wouldn't probably solve everyone's gripe with it, but I think it would be a step in the right direction. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there's, I don't think there's a fix-all for for that problem, but I, I think that would be actually a good suggestion. I, I Like you mentioned, with it being more sport-oriented, trying to incorporate you know, how sports actually handle these types of issues and applying it to their product might you know, make the audience feel more... You know, invested in the product itself because you know it might it has more you know reality to it. So after we came back from the the commercial break, the first one we noticed how they were going to handle this with Cody and Jericho. I think right I don't know if it was right after, but the next match was Brandon Cutler and MJF. And um, I think we're all MJF fans in this room. You know, he's he's better than us, and we know it. Um, the thing that I, my one bugaboo about a lot of Cody matches, like I said, he feels the need to make everyone. So he takes a match that could be eight minutes and makes it 12 to 13 minutes, and that's two to three minutes too long sometimes. So with this match, this was a match done right. Brandon Cutler did not look like a chump. The match was maybe five to six minutes, and MJF won convincingly without making Cutler necessarily look like a jobber. I think this is... For TV, you, like these matches are, are a necessity because you need to get people out there that don't normally are going to get a big chunk of your very valuable TV time. So I think 
this match with MJF and Cutler. I know Jake's got a lot to say about this one. But to me, this is a, I won't call it a squash match. I don't have a name for it yet. But this is a TV match done right. It's like, it's more like a squat, it's more like a mashed match. It's not squashed, but it's mashed. Like, you can still recognize. Gently mashed, yes. Pretty much, yes. But, uh, I originally didn't like this match. I was like, well, Cutler did kind of look a little weak here. But at the same time, during the match, as I was thinking it over, they did play up a bit of an injury angle with, I believe, Cutler's arm Mm -hmm. or his leg. I I assume it's his arm, because based on how the match ended. It was his arm, so... I have a feeling they're going to build it up to rematches, which, if that's the case, then okay, because originally I was like, like I said, Cutler kind of looked like he got his legs cut out from under him, but the more I thought about it, the more it kind of got better as it went along. So if there's going to be a Cutler MJF 2, I'd be all for it. Oh yeah, I think uh, MJF has a... You know, obviously a lot of potential with the future. He he was an obvious win for this match. Uh, when we're talking Brandon, Brandon Cutler, you know, he has a great story. Um, I'd like to see him work a little more on the mic, see how he at, uh, talks in front of a live audience. Um, the way this was the first singles match that he's had, and I think it went over pretty well. He, he had a good showing. Um, I really like that uh, sunset uh, powerbomb that he did, too. Yeah, he... um. I don't know how he is with a live mic. I will say he's had a lot of time on being the elite, which is a more controlled environment. They could do a couple takes if he messes up a scene. But he seems to be getting pretty comfortable with that, so that could be another step in that direction. But, um, yeah, I love the way, like, for now we'll go with it was a mashed match. It wasn't a squash. It was mashed. Um, And it really, the ending did kind of come out of nowhere. It made you feel... Like we were talking about before, you can't just cut to a commercial because you never know when a guy is going to grab another guy's arm and rank back until he taps out. Like, we were all talking, thinking this match was going to go a few more minutes, and we look up, and, you know, he's got that arm, and it was over. So um, I think these matches are a necessity for when you're on TV because, you need, you know, their roster is it's not WWE size, but it is fairly big. So sometimes you're going to get these guys to go out there and have a quick five-minute match and... You know, would we'll give it to him. This wasn't cruiser waste. This wasn't a bunch of moves that are going to give Jim Cornette a heart attack. But it was. It still had a level of technicality to it that was able to end quickly. And I could see. I don't think we're going to necessarily get the rematch for this right away. But I would love to see maybe you know just a little bit of fancy booking. Brandon Cutler is in a situation where like he can kind of be a lovable loser and then kind of pull a you know, way down the line, get his first win, make the story of his losing streak. I think he's someone who can pull that off well. Um, so maybe down the line, you know, beating MJF in a roll-up, you know, and make the crowd go crazy like a like a Brian Kendrick with no hair, I guess is what I'm thinking about. But, um, yeah, no, I like the Brennan Cutler character. He's obviously very vital to behind the scenes. I mentioned him and his wife make the gear. He's known the Bucks for a long time. And I think giving him that on-air personality of like a lovable loser wouldn't be a terrible way to go. Since uh, since Cutler and the Bucks are childhood friends, I wonder if MJF will bring that up in a promo. You know, like to last night at, at, on the first episode of All Elite Wrestling Dynamite, I beat the Young Bucks' best friend. Like, not even mention Cutler's name. Like, just say the Young Bucks' best friend or the Young Bucks' lackey or something like that. If they don't bring up like the friendship between Cutler and the Bucks, I see that as a missed opportunity. I mean, it was mentioned on commentary, so they at least put that in your head for those that don't watch being the leader, didn't know that, you know, the way we do. Um, so, just a quick jump away from uh, matches themselves. There was a few bits in here. We had Jay and Silent Bob at ringside, which right before the show they uh, took pictures with the tag team belts, which never got showed on camera unless I missed it when I was grabbing a drink or something. Um, so, yeah, they just put them on social media, which they look like cool belts. They reminded me of like the TNA era NWA titles, like America's Most Wanted kind of stuff. But they had Jay and Silent Bob. They had Jack Evans and and Angelico come out. And uh, so they had that bit. And then they had a pretty funny bit with SCU. You had Scorpio Sky doing the Obama bit. But um, I I enjoyed these slightly comical but serious enough kind of cutaways from the vignettes that they that they did. I I think they did they did well with these. WWE's tag team division is kind of a dead horse, like, in terms of people beating it, like, beating the dead horse, but AEW's tag team division, in my opinion, is already 
miles away better because they've given these teams actual characters. We know who the faces and the he and the heels are, and it and it's already setting up tantalizing matches. Like I can't wait to see a possible SCU Lucha Brothers match, and I can't wait to see the uh, the Light Bright Brothers versus Private Party, and I and I can't wait to see what the Jurassic Express are going to do and what the Dark Order is going to do. I'm already more invested in AEW's tag team division from just seeing four of the teams on this one episode than either WWE brand's tag team division. And not to bury WWE, I am not trying to do that. I'm just saying one is clearly playing chess while the other is playing checkers. Yeah, I mean, the, the goal of both these segments that you're referring to was to build up the uh, tag team tournament that's going to be starting next week. Right. Um, it's going to be with Private Party versus Angelico and Jack Evans, and then I do believe it is going to be SCU and uh, um, the Lucha Bros as well. And we found out that it's going to be Kazarian and Christopher Daniels, right. the former four-time tag champions, that's going to be... Uh, so that even had a point to it yeah. when they got, and I totally forgot to just real quick to mention the Jay and Slam Bob bit had Private Party in there too. I totally forgot about that for a second. So you're right, they did highlight three to four tag teams without them having to step in the ring. So that that's a, a good way done with that. Obviously, the TV time is precious, so you're gonna have to find creative ways to do it. And they really do have an avenue that with being the elite, like they can push storylines through being the elite. Uh, you know that it maybe can't, doesn't quite make TV. It's on the cutting room floor. They're able to, you know, they they didn't really mess with it at all on TV because they wanted to focus on that. But in the future, they can plug that. They can say, go to the Being the Elite YouTube page. You know, see what what our guys are doing between episodes of Dynamite. And I think that's gonna that could go a long way. Like if if something doesn't make air, it can easily storyline wise get put on that, which I think is a really good vessel and avenue for them to have. Yeah, so um, I wanted to mention also with the live experience that the, the crowd gets, uh, you know, they wanted, from what I recall, that Tony Khan, who ironically wasn't, didn't make an appearance tonight. Which I was very surprised about. Yeah, uh, but I do recall he did mention that, you know, the show wasn't going to be over after the, the television airing of it completed. Like, they wanted to incorporate more of an experience for the people that are attending the event. A lot of the show was actually in the arena versus, you know, backstage segments, which is something that they mentioned, too, that they wanted to start incorporating. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, some of that footage from after the shows showed up on Being the Elite as well. And yeah, I'm not too sure about if there was any dark matches whatsoever to end up on a Twitter exclusive mm -hmm. match or whatever. But I doubt they did that today, but I'm, I'm sure that's something like uh, TNA Explosion comes to mind or like Superstars, like something like that that could happen down the line just to make sure these guys, because like two hours, it used to be the norm and now it just isn't. Like even like Raw is three hours, SmackDown was two hours with uh, 205 Live connected to it. Uh, Smack uh, was it Superstars and they did um, main, event. main event. I don't know if they even still do those anymore. Um, you know those are always attached to those shows. So those shows are easily four hours plus, no matter what. Yeah, so for, when we were going to NXT, they were taping four episodes at a time. Right. Yeah, it was a good three and a half to four hour show. I mean, the few times we went to, they only did three episodes. You know, everyone's looking around like, oh, that's it. Like. As much as we complain about the three-hour Raw, we are kind of accustomed to it now, and that can be their fault or not. But, um, yeah, I mean, two hours of, like, balls-to-the-wall action and then a little bit on the side, I think that's enough to hold you over. But if you just do the two hours, I mean, I guess it really depends on the pricing and everything, and you're only going to go the one time. And it is on a in the middle of the week. I mean, some people are happy that they get out at 10 and they're home in an hour. I mean, when we went to the Jacksonville show, like, we were very hyped to be there, but... By the end of the match, and it was by the end of the night, the main event was something we wanted to see, but we were kind of like, it's kind of already like about to be Five midnight. Hours later. Yeah, so I mean, like, I get it, and like, you don't want to miss the miss anything either, but like, they run a fine line of like burning people out and like ending it too soon. So I think they'll eventually find their their happy medium here. So another match, I guess we can mention real quick is uh, the Hangman Page and Pac match. Here's another one that. Uh, I really like the pacing of it. They, I think they cut to one of those commercials, but you felt the need that you, you had to stay with this match because you didn't know when it was going to end. Um, it made Pac look like a, you know, like a complete beast, and I don't, 
I get that Hangman necessarily doesn't. I'm curious at this point. I, I assume now if Pac doesn't take his ball and go home with the original main event of All Out, or Double or Nothing, excuse me, I assume Pac was going to win that title then because it doesn't look like they had any interest in putting uh, Page over on Pac in this match. Like, is that essentially the match they would have had at the pay-per-view? Maybe a little bit shorter. But, um, I, you know, Hang- Hangman was really put in that top echelon, and now it looks like he's going to, you know, get to the back of the line for a while. Yeah, he and Omega are both looking like they're going to be biding their time waiting for uh, waiting for their title shots. And when this whole All Elite Wrestling experiment was announced, I'm like, okay, okay, Omega's going to be either either near or at the top of the card, and, and Paige will be groomed to be at the top of the card. And I was right about one of those things, Paige being groomed to be near the top, and Omega hasn't really been doing anything worthy of note. He's just been losing. I mean, he did he did lose to Pac at All Out, which, special note on Pac, he kind of looks like Legolas the Elf from The Lord of the Rings <laughs> if he wore the ring all the time and it just started corrupting his soul, <laughs> which it, it has nothing to do with wrestling, but every time I was like, wow, Legolas must have took in the ring by accident. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I thought this match was pretty good. Kind of going back to what you're saying, Phil, I don't necessarily think this would have been the match that they would have had at Double or Nothing. Um, I think there was some conflict due to the point that uh, Pac didn't want to go over, so he wouldn't, or couldn't technically, you know, put Paige over because, you know, he was... World champion champion somewhere else. uh, You know, another promotion, um, and there was conflict of interest there. So it seemed like at that point they did have the idea that, you know, at Double or Nothing we wanted Paige to win. Um, obviously things changed, and, you know, that changes the storylines. And uh, referring to what you were saying, Jake, with Omega and um, uh, Hangman Page, Page uh, I do feel like there is some more character building there that, you know, allows people who are more casual wrestling fans who aren't really invested in these guys that don't really know their, their you know, history and aren't watching the online stuff that they do, haven't seen any of their wrestling before, is a good opportunity to invest into their characters and they're not necessarily, you know, already over, you know, already the champion. They, they have something to prove at this point. Yeah, like, if you, let's say, like, when we were hanging out, you know, uh, my girlfriend was here, girlfriend was there, my roommate was here, they probably don't know who Kenny Omega is at all. And they actually left this show with no impression of him whatsoever. Like, it's very odd that Kenny Omega can get in a wrestling ring and not impact you at all. And he was just another guy on this show. And granted, there will eventually be a point that he will make the impact because he's too talented not to. But um, And this is probably too much too soon for this, but they will at some point need a mid-card title because there was too many Chiefs and not enough Indians. They have a lot of mid, uh, you know, main event talent, and the main event scene is only so small. And they, of course, they already have a lot of uh, built-in tag teams. Like WWE finds ways to put main event guys together into tag teams sometimes. You have the Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman thing. Uh, you get guys that are, you know, floundering. You got Chad Gable, Bobby Roode situations. But there's too many main event guys that you need to give them something to do. Like, some of them you can branch off and give them, like, a really intense story with each other. But eventually, I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I think it's blaring, blaring obvious from episode one that they will need some other title or some other accolade for other people to fight for. A mid-card title is absolutely a must. Uh, that's, that's all I'll say about that. It is an absolute must. The elite champion. I mean, I'm I'm good with that. You know what I miss? Because me and you used to go back when it was FCW, and they had the FCW 15 title. I don't know if you recall this. It was actually a medal. It was never a belt, Jake. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Was, but wasn't the title like where all the matches were contested like under a 15 minute time limit? Yeah, it was. Well, it was, it was like an Iron Man situation. So you had 15 minutes to get the most falls, and it was actually built on a rivalry against Seth Rollins and uh, Dean Ambrose. Back when I didn't know, I knew Tyler Black and I had no idea who Dean Ambrose was. But, like, you can give it some sort of a gimmick. I don't think we want, like, an Impact Grand Champion situation. I don't think we want that necessarily. But you can give it, like, a gimmick if you really wanted to. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's pretty apparent that that will be needed. Maybe not right away because, you know, the, the tag team tournament is going to take center stage for the next, probably leading up to a full year at least, you know, their next pay per view. I just had a thought. What's up? 
Maybe, since AEW is now on television, they bring back the television title and give it and have like a defense, like not maybe not every episode, but like maybe a, every other episode and have it like strict 15 minute time limit. If they go the distance, then they like do it again the with, next week or something with like a 30 minute time yeah. limit or some, something like that. I'm just spitballing. Yeah, no, that's here, not a bad idea. A TV title because they are very much. In the fact that we are on TV now, so it's it's not whereas you know like they they've already dominated the internet. They don't need an internet title like we thought WWE needed at some point. But I think a TV title could easily work for them. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Um, like you mentioned, now that they're on TV, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean they're and uh, as much as they try not to, and like I think it's all the good ways. I don't think they carried over a lot of the bad ways. But this is a this is WCW at heart. Like the core aspect of what they're doing. Is from I mean maybe hearing Shivani on there maybe it's same but like a lot of it is WCW grassroots so somebody I guarantee you has already pitched that at some point by now um, so moving over to the main event the match maybe it's just because we've had these really long events with the Bucks but like I looked at the time and they had like twenty three minutes and I'm like this might be the shortest Bucks match I've ever seen like they that is one thing they have to work on they're phenomenal but they need to. They need to tell their 30-minute story in 15 minutes sometimes. And I think they did an okay job of this. This match was a very chaotic six-man match, which is what you could expect. Um, I think Moxley coming out and doing that DDT to uh, Omega on the glass table was insane. Like, that is something that's going to be remembered. That's going to be a lot of highlight packages. But overall, this match was very fast-paced. The heels won in a way that makes sense. Um, I don't know how you guys feel, but for the first main event ever... I don't know that it holds up hold up to that pristine, but in a bubble, I think the match was, was as good as it needed to be for a TV match. To paraphrase a quote from Jim Cornette, it's nice to see John Moxley uh, to be released from prison and actually stepping outside and talking to people. <laughs> yeah, I felt this match. You know, it, it wasn't the you know uh, Meltzer five star or six seven star ratings that he's given to these some of these wrestlers in the past. Uh, but, you know, it, it did the job that it needed to do. It, it you know, advanced storylines with, you know, Moxley and Omega and, you know, the Bucks and uh, Ortiz and Santana, Cody and, you know, Chris Jericho. Then we got the surprise, you know, debut of Jack Hager. Mm-hmm. What's he going to do? Is I, he... I was just going to mention Jake Hagar, which I, I popped huge for because I started watching wrestling in 2009. It, this is a small tangent, I promise, but... Started watching wrestling in 2009. One of the hate, most hated wrestlers I saw was Jack Swagger. I thought he was a jerk. He was one of those jock frat boy jerks that you just wanted to punch. And and over time, as he fell out of relevance, I kind of missed him. But then he started popping up in Bellator, and I believe he's 3-0, and if I remember correctly. I don't know the number, but I know he's undefeated. And and I was like, wow, that guy, that guy's really doing well for himself. And now he's all elite, and my heart is all flutter. Like he's just gonna be doctor bombing people left and right. It looks like he's maybe the heavy for Chris Jericho, or maybe he might go out on his own. Either way, I'm just happy to see him. I know many people are like, wow, you are really marking out over Jake Hager. Yes, I'm really marking out over Jake Hagar. Fight me, change my mind. <laughs> You have the right to change my mind. <laughs> yeah, and of note, too, also who came out with Sammy Guevara, who, you know, had that beginning match with Cody, he came out at the end, too, so I felt like that kind of elevated him, too. Uh, yeah, who thought the guy with the panda hat could be such a dick? Like, yes. I did not expect him to go full heel, like, right away like that. He wears a panda to the ring. How could anyone boo this man? Yeah, how could well, he... Washington, D.C. figured out a way. Yeah. Um, I almost, and I thought about this just a few minutes ago, I think Hager will almost be like the Christian cage, like when Christ, when Christian got to TNA and it's like, look at what you guys missed out on. I think he could easily be that. I, I didn't, I didn't really put that connection together of him being the heavy for Chris Jericho. I don't know that it is, but I, seeing, hearing you say that, that would be totally a good way to do it. I don't know how he is on the mic. He could easily be the guy that just stands there with his, you know, I wasn't a fan of, you know, his, his polo shirt. Like you could probably look a little more like a badass when you're doing what you're doing here. But, um, yeah, he could easily be the heavy. He could be, like, a slightly different. I almost put him, like, the Matt Morgan to Kurt Angle situation, I guess. But, um, but yeah, the way they all stood together at the end, you, you even asked the question, it's like, is this a group that's forming? We joked about, like, oh, is it the NWO? Is he the sixth man? But, um, 
No, I don't. I don't know. Is it a group? I mean, they they didn't. There wasn't a lot of unity. There's a lot of that was a very diverse group. I mean, AEW was all about diversity, clearly. But uh, you know, you, you have a tag team, you have the main eventer, you have a lower mid carder, and you have you know the Jake muscle. Hager. Which yeah, the muscle. Um, I don't know what you call that. I don't. It's not DX. It's it's four horsemen with two extra people. Uh, but uh, if it is a group, I mean, that's interesting. I don't know how you if, guys feel. If it is a group, I suggest that we shall all call it the Jericho Foundation. Like the Heart <laughs> Foundation, but with Jericho instead of Heart. Uh, in all seriousness, though, I don't think it, this is going to be a group. It's, it's, it, I think it's going to be like a very loose group. Like Sting in WCW, when he was just about to win his first world title, he was a part of a group called the Dudes with Attitudes, along with the Junkyard Dog, Paul Orndorff, and the Steiner Brothers. And they weren't an official group, per se, but they were a very loose group, meaning they were all baby faces and they were all going against the Four Horsemen. I think that the Jericho Foundation, as I'm going to choose to call them, are going to be like the dudes with attitudes. They're going to be a very loose group, but the one thing that connects them is the fact that they're all bad guys and they're going against the elite, pretty much. Yeah, I think it could be one of those more of an old-school take where, like, all heels are friends, in a way. Like, they have the the bad guy locker room, so, you know, maybe they're all... Just because we're all bad guys, we're all cool with each other. Um, but other than that, I mean... just don't touch each other. Yeah, yeah, you know, they have that weird unspoken bond. We're all, we're all bad guys here, I guess, but... uh Oh, no, other than that, I think it was a great show. I mean, I'm looking forward to next week. I'm looking forward to watching NXT. I didn't want to touch on that at all. Um, but other than that, thank you guys for coming over. Appreciate us talking about this. And I don't know if we're going to do an every week thing, but I like to make this kind of a regular thing. So uh, let's do this old school way. Uh, signing off for the Phil Talk Sports Podcast, I'm Dreamcast Phil. Jake Ryan is epic. And I'm me, Just Billy. I'm getting old. <laughs> we'll see you next time. And for those that remember, we'll save you a seat.